my name is José Pupino. As I said, uh, uh, now I'm based in Brazil, uh, in Getúlio Vargas Foundation, that's a think tank, but also I come every year to Fudão University, to the School of International Relations and Public Affairs, uh, for around a month every year, and then this is an opportunity also to interact with colleagues uh, doing uh, work in the same area in China and around the world. Uh, the title of my talk is, is about green growth. Uh, the idea is possible to grow economically and reduce carbon emissions, this is the question. And uh, this is part, uh, I'm going to mention a lot of publications that uh, we did in the last few years. Uh, and this is a part of a project that you uh, supported with uh, APN, Asian Pacific Network for Global Change, that we worked during two years with different kind of scholars to try to understand uh, Green Group. But also going to mention other publications, if you have interest, I can uh, provide links and, and, and even the, the, the publications. I'm now based in Brazil. FGV is interesting that we are a think tank. Uh, two thirds of our staff working only in research, applied research, uh, but also we have School of Management and Economics. I work in the School of, uh, uh, of, of Public Management in this foundation in Brazil. And you are ranked the, the number one think tank in Latin America for the last eight years, and also around the top ten worldwide. Uh, it, this is the, the publication I mentioned to you. A lot of things I'm going to talk is about this book we published last year. It's about the discussions on whether green growth is an alternative uh, for, particularly in this case, for uh, climate change mitigation and look at, 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 at long term. Well, and the questions I, I put here, the questions to try to address in this presentation and also give some sense of what exactly green growth probably some, most of you are familiar, uh, but there are different meanings, why, uh, what society around it, what results it experienced in green growth so far. Uh, and the, the, the key questions are the bottom two questions is, can really green growth lead us to a more sustainable society? And then if it's not green growth, then what? What is the, the alternative to that? And this, uh, one of the publications uh, I, I, I worked at was this Quinquennial Report of the UN SCAP, the, the a, a, a Economic and Social Commission for Asian Pacific, that uh, UNU, when I was UNU, were part IGS also of this publication. And you look at how interesting in Asia, there is obviously a, 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 a correlation between GDP per capita, you see, horizontal and, 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 and poverty reduction. So as GDP grows, uh, you have reduction in total number of people uh, under the poverty line. China particularly being very successful in this, around uh, 600 million people went out of poverty in China in the last uh, 30 years, uh, particularly because of the economic growth. But at the same time, the result, you also have a strong correlation between economic growth and our ec economic output or GDP per capita and emissions. And at the same time, see, Asia brought a lot of people out of poverty at the same time having increased, incre increase in the greenhouse gas emissions. And also other problems related to that, uh, for example, air pollution. Today, Asia hosts the 10 most polluted cities in the world, uh, all in Asia. And part of this because of the, the economic development. And you have gone through different planetary boundaries because of that. Asia has contributed a lot because 60% of the population in the world live in Asia. And a lot of uh, uh, solutions for the global problem has uh, had necessarily passed through Asia because where the economic growth is, where the population is. And what I see is, is for example, now per capita carb CO2 emissions. China, even though it's much poorer, is around the same level as European Union. Uh, uh, and it, it is basically a result of the economic growth based on uh, energy intense industry, particularly energy generated by coal. For, by coal. But at the same time, you see China, probably we'll talk about this very quickly, in the last few years, three years, 
Tan actually has flattened the emissions and even reduced uh, 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 some of the emissions, uh, reducing also per capita, particularly because of the, the, the production of coal. At the same time, the economic growth continues. And is an example, people say, OK, there is a green growth. You kind of grow economically 10 6% a year. At the same time, carbon emissions, CO2 emissions, in this case, being reduced. And China could be an example of green growth, but they try to question this as well. And this is different uh, uh, reasons, particularly because of the coal production and consumption has reduced in China. But I'm not going this in detail. Another thing interesting in not only Asian Pacific, but around the world, you have had during the last uh, 30 years uh, improvement in carbon intensity. It, it means you produce the same GDP, same dollar, with less emissions now than before. And these come across all continents, uh, not only Asia Pacific, but this is a trend as countries develop. Uh, in general, they produce uh, 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 more GDP with less energy and with less emissions. And then interesting, you could say also seeing this kind of uh, uh, green growth, no? But still, when you think about what needs to be done, you know, a lot of people are out of poverty, but you still have a lot of countries that are under poverty line, and a lot of people, they will move above the, the poverty line, around 2.6 billion people in Asia, they still right over the $2 a day that the official poverty rate. It means there is economic recession in Asia. Many of these people could go back to, to poverty. You know? and, and interestingly, one thing and I, I work a lot is urbanization. Uh, Asia has put one of the reasons of the increase in emissions because a lot of people moved to, to the cities, around 1 billion people in the last 20 years. And the next 20 years, another 1 billion people in Asia will move to the cities. Uh, China alone has today more than 130 cities with more than 1 million inhabitants. That's, for example, Eastern Europe. Western Europe is less than 10. It means China to, alone is a huge uh, drive in terms of urbanization. And the green growth now is this political discourse that's possible to decouple economic growth from environmental pressures, and you could keep growing and uh, reduce the, the, the emissions more than that. The solution for the environmental problems and climate change would be the economic growth. Because if you decouple, more you grow, uh, less pollution you have. And then it's the idea that economic uh, growth would be the solution for the environmental problem, particularly when you think the idea of ecological modernization, that the kind of solution based on, on uh, technology, innovation, and management, uh, 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 smartness, innovation that are, are capable to address many of those problems and increase efficiency. No? Uh, and basically, some people say is a player for sustainable development without tears. Basically, you can keep growing, and then you don't have to worry much about uh, 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 the links with the environment, because if you do the things right, you can decouple economic growth from environmental pressure. You could basically achieve sustainable development without crying too much and without me, uh, or I'll say without have a cold shower. You know, you just basically can keep things as usual. And he started, uh, uh, Korea was very important and the President Lee to push this agenda, particularly in SCAP, and he came to the agenda of Rio Plus 20 process in, in UNEP. Uh, and this is the report that launches, the, the report I just show you, the work it was the report five years later, uh, with the, the idea that you could decouple that and then Korea had a national plan for that. You know? And also, uh, during the financial crisis in 2007, a lot of countries in Europe, uh, they came with the idea that, uh, you know, the, the solution to it, to, to, uh, uh, Start again, economic growth would be an investment in green technology. And it became very uh, uh, fashionable to say, you know, uh, all these green uh, funds, uh, what Canadian programs, you know, which invest money in infrastructure, green infrastructure, and then could recreate economic growth. But uh, 
But now a little bit about the economics part, where growth comes from, why countries and uh, societies, they all think that growth is the solution for most of the problem. This comes from the Adam Smith, that is the economist of the, the, uh, uh, the 18th century, where they said, okay, it's not only the economic standards that define how people are happy, but when people are happier, when there is economic growth, when there is change, and they feel they are uh, be becoming better and better, and this is where they are happy. And, and this we see in the, the industrial revolution that brought a lot of societal transformation, and also re improved the quality of life of many people around the world. To have an idea, in England, in the, the Adam, Adam Smith time, the average uh, longevity of people was under 40 years old, around 32 years old. And today, not even the poorest country in the world has this longevity. It means a lot of improvements with the economic growth. But however, recently, this is what we discussed in the research, the book. First, a lot of countries that are already rich, they have, uh, not, they are not so rich like my country. <laughs> Uh, they still have internal problems of delivering growth. More and more, the ability of country to deliver growth as they become rich and become more difficult. Obviously, I can't explain. It. Second, the other problem with growth you see recently in literature is the Smithian promise, the idea that people will be happier with more growth when you're growing. But you see that uh, a lot of people questioning that that aspect that in many cases economic growth no longer improves health, happiness and well-being and there are a lot of discussion about new index to measure happiness and also a lot of people question economic growth, the eight, a lot of economic space, the figure I show you, the, 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 the boundaries uh, and the idea that green growth is exactly what called environmentalism of the rich is the idea that this curve, that Kasner curve, many of you know the Kasner curve, the per capita income environment deterioration, it means the environment gets worse as you, when you are poor, you start to develop, but at a certain point, there is this tipping point, turning point income that you actually get better as you develop. And the environmental reach is basically you go quickly from here to here, and then you can uh, uh, solve all the the problems and use energy, get rich, and save the planet. Basically, is this this idea? You can't really, uh, but is it true? And then there are many critics. And first, uh, there are the critics of Martini Salier. Uh, some of you may know John, the the, uh, uh, the Ecological Economics Association. They talk environmentalism of the poor. They actually, the poor people are more environmentalists than the rich people, not because we're rich, now we can afford the environment, but it shows that actually it's the opposite. Also, the cousin term, uh, the cousin curve explain uh, uh, well short-term and long, short-term pollutants, uh, air pollution, water pollution, but not long-term like climate change. And also, there is this scale effect, the Jevon paradox, it, it, it means uh, you think of you more efficient, actually, you're going to reduce the emissions, but in the long term, you end up increasing the emissions because now it will be cheaper the energy, and then you use more energy. In the end, you know you reduce five percent uh, efficiency, but if you grow f uh, uh, fifty percent because you can buy more energy, in the end up having more pollution. And this is called Jevons paradox that was actually found in the 19th century. It's not something new. Uh, and then I'll show some cases you don't. For example, uh, research in China, you see a lot of improvements in energy efficiency. In China, for example, uh, uh, the, the carbon emission from fuel combustion per unit of GDP improved 55% 50 uh, between 1990 to 2011, even though like increase in the emissions. Why? Exactly because the economic growth has offset a lot of these this improvement to have improvement. Korea, the same thing. Korea has doubled the emissions per capita, even though it has improved the efficiency. It means how much of these efficiencies actually lead to overall emission reduction, 
this can be questioned and, and the, the, the research, you know, the data you have from the past show that's not possible. The economic growth end up offsetting a lot of the improvements in efficiency. Just to give you an example, if you talk about carbon, these are a PwC price waterhouse coppers, they mean, okay, to reach the two degrees uh, uh, Celsius in 2050, you need basically uh, uh, the global carbon intensity now needs to fall around 5% per year. I mean, every year you need to be 5% more efficient in the use of, particularly in this case, carbon intensity. Every year you reduce 5%. But when you get the data from countries, not even one country in the previous decade uh, reached close to the 5%. You know, uh, 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 and China is one of them. Prove it, but you know, need to be around 6% per year. And more than that, can this decouple be absolute? You saw that the couple can be intensity of carbon, and China, for example, 2020 has this commitment to uh, improve efficiency around 40, 60% of 2005 emissions. But can you, for example, if you want to achieve the two degrees, you require with the current GDP 21 fold improvement in the efficiency of resources. And more, if the developing countries reach the same level, for example, as Europe in GDP per capita, you need 130 times improvement. In the same air conditioning here, the G cooling us, we need to do the same work with just less than 1% of the energy they use now in order you know, to not increase the emission. I mean, the coupling for the data you have empirically will be very difficult to also, a lot of questions when you look at inclusivity of green growth. Uh, uh, people say about green jobs. When you go and look at and the, uh, 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 the uh, International Labor Organization did a study about what kind of these green jobs are out there. A lot of these jobs actually is this kind of job. Not because of recycling, but a lot of the electronics, for example, are sent to Africa, where a lot of the work is done by children and by people informally it means it's not because it's a green recycling it means that it's a better job the same quality of jobs you get and then people question it also the the recently the inequality has increased and you see this the same thing with environmental inequality access to the service uh today for 62 people richest people own the same wealth of half of the poorest people you know, only 62 people. Uh, and you see this in the other countries, and you enjoy cheap ecosystem service in the other side, you have the problems it's causing. And also a lot of inequalities in the consumer, consumption of ecosystem service and generation of ecosystem service that the people uh, uh, do not address when you talk about green growth. Anyway, the, and then if it's not green growth, then what? You had this conference, and came all these people, Christians first, some people said either we save capitalism or save ourselves. You cannot have capitalism uh, uh, and the, the uh, healthy earth. You need to choose one of them. All the people, a lot of work in Europe don't own the idea of degrowth. Actually have reduced economic growth and open ecological space for the developing countries to be able to, to grow. But even if you degrow, a lot of exercise of degrowth, for example, didn't reduce the emissions because the system is the same, not necessary because you have negative growth, you have a, 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 a improvement in the, in the emissions. An example is my country, Brazil, has reduced the economy minus 3%, 3.8% last year, but the emissions have increased. Uh, I mean, it doesn't necessarily means that is the system the same, maybe it's not. Uh, uh. And also, what people see actually, you are starting doing behind, beyond the, the growth, a kind of transformations. You have to make these structural sense of the system you are of generating growth, and also, uh, 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 let's say, depending on the economic system on growth to keep the system intact, is in the long term, if you don't transform the system, you'll not be able to achieve any of the goals. It'll be always dependent on the growth to, uh, 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 for, uh, 
improve our, our the idea that it's still a culture of sufficiency is still lacking in many of these discussions. New approach and policy and just to finalize you know what you were thinking that could then come, you know, how you you end our addiction to growth. You know, even countries that has per capita income around a hundred thousand dollars a year, that's be more or less more than ten times times more than China, they still want growth. You need to grow. Uh, uh, how is end up this growth? Well different kind of work. Uh, first uh, uh, final two min one minute. First, you know, you look at the urban, for example, the area, you see for the urbanization rates are more correlated to greenhouse gas emissions than, for example, GDP per capita. I mean, two countries with the same GDP per capita, same wealth, the one that's more urbanized, you're going to emit more emissions, greenhouse gas. Why this? Uh, the structure of urbanization is a problem. And one of the solutions, the work you have done, the urbanization and climate core benefits, the book just I just got the book, Professor Jim contributes one chapter. I just got the book before I came here. Uh, uh, the idea that you can deliver is still needed more service, more infrastructure, more energy, uh, and raise the incomes of people, the poor, particularly the poor, at the same time as reduce climate emissions. The idea that you can make those compatible. Second, you see cities like Tokyo that have put cap in the emissions, including buildings, the first city in the world to do that. And it's interesting that Tokyo, because of that, didn't become less competitive. It, uh, it has reduced a lot of emissions more than other cities. At the same time, a lot of innovations took place there. Uh, if you want, I can send the publication as well. And I look at different kinds of developments. We have a small country that border China and India. It's called Bhutan. There, the paradigm is not growth, but uh, we call happiness, gross national happiness. I'm studying this country. I find very interesting how this gr gross national happiness actually changed a lot of the priorities of the countries, and they have actually improved a lot in terms of reduction in poverty, but at the same time, they have not increased the emissions as the, the other countries, and they have put, for example, 60% of Bhutan territories is a forest, 40% protected area, the largest in the world, the country with the largest percentage of protected area, and the country is just a... <coughs> just to finalize, the, the, the key message, the economic is, is unlikely to achieve in the long term uh, as a solution to climate change, particularly for rich countries. Uh, uh, the core risk courses are necessary but not sufficient. Innovation is important, but will not solve all the problems we have in terms of climate change. And uh, also we need to change the frameworks and I just put it, the idea that you need uh, a bottom up, top down uh, uh, in terms of uh, a combination to the solutions. But more than that, you have to shift in terms of research now, the discussions from what policy are needed. A lot of people need green taxes, you need green investment, but why it doesn't happen? You have to move it uh, with my research now from what policies are needed to the political institution conditions to allow this policy to emerge. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, and I see maybe you have a question later on, but I can send another to the case.